All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to the show. It is me, your clearly your favorite host of all time. Uh, and joining me today, I have my uh, host and co-host, Peter. Second favorite welcome host. Back. Least least favorite I host, think... depending on who you ask. Yeah, I guess that's true. If you're if you're my only host, then that all you're both my favorite and least favorite. I mean... <laughs> I just prefer to think of you as my favorite. There you go. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And we also have one of my editors. We have Neslig joining us again. Welcome back. Hello, hello. Glad to have you. And we have uh, some people in the side chat. We have Dalton, Icarus, uh, Vesta, Jamie, Bibia. Welcome. Come one, come all to see mm -hmm. the uh, the train wreck that awaits all of you. Um. <laughs> Icarus says, hey, Icarus says time, I'm I'm the most average favorite host. I I, I guess that I that, mean yeah. I guess. Oh, we have Bree, Hive Science. Hey Bree. Welcome. Uh so let's see. Last time we uh started and Savage Cope. We started a video uh which is like an hour long, I think. Um it's uh, was it mathematical challenges to evolution? Mm-hmm. Or I think that was it. Or mathematical challenges to Darwinism, or something like that. I don't know. It's along those lines. Um, which actually has people who are in the um, the uh, uh, the intro video in it. It has Stephen Meyer and um, David Berlinski, and there's another guy, David Gelernter, who's also in there. So the three of them are being interviewed uh, for. I don't remember what the YouTube is. It's not the DIS channel. It's some other channel. That are getting interviewed, and the um, could we tell people the, what uh, Gelernter means? Is that's German? Oh, what does it mean? Learned. Oh, okay. Someone, Didn't someone, someone who's who actually studied. Who's a learned person? Okay. Well, that, he that doesn't show. Um, <laughs> well, the thing is, these guys are getting interviewed to explain why evolution is wrong, and none of them are biologists. Mm -hmm. Galerinter is learned in like computer science or computer software engineering, something like that, something along those lines. Then you have Berlinski, who's a mathematician, and then you have Stephen Meyer, who's a philosopher. Now, none of them are biologists. None of them have and any then, right. And to... not, not, not even the interviewer. So the interviewer is all like, well, I don't know anything about biology. Right. You guys don't know anything about biology. So <laughs> let's talk about biology together. <laughs> but basically, yeah, yeah. No one has any relevant credentials here, right? I mean, it's it, they're talking about mathematical challenges, but it, the mathematical challenges would be in population genetics. So it's not just math. It's math with respect to biology. So even Berlinski, who is an actual mathematician, this isn't his area. He's not a population geneticist. He's and it's also and it's also not like they haven't uh, shown their lack of understanding in the case of Stephen Meyer. We we know he has made some mistakes on paleontology before. Oh Lord, yeah, Meyer, who is a, again a philosopher, has written a book about paleontology, and he wrote another book about cell biology. Um. He's not qualified in either of those fields. He has no um, education in, in, in those fields whatsoever. He has no room to be writing on them. He has an actual um, a bachelor's degree in geology, which, cool, great, because he worked in the, the oil industry for a little bit. Oh. But, again, not paleontology, not cell biology. He has no room to be talking on these subjects. <clears throat> Oh. I'm curious, oh. uh, just, just, just out of curiosity, do you know his opinion on uh, climate change or not? I, I actually don't, funny enough. I'm <laughs> Somehow I wouldn't be surprised to find him being like, you know, he's anti-anthropogenic climate change or something, but Perhaps. I don't know. I can't I can't say that for certain. I don't know, actually. So, so what, when you say he worked in the oil industry, is I haven't heard of any geologist in the oil industry who's working off uh, a young earth model he's not a young earther oh okay oh none okay. of them are young earthers as, as far as i know i don't think any of these three are young earthers now there are some um 
uh, there are some ID proponents like Paul Nelson uh, and I think Ann Gager who are young earth creationists, but Meyer is not. Meyer, Behe, uh, Dembski, the kind of core ID guys, they're mm -hmm. not young earthers. Except, I don't know about Wells. Wells is a curious case because he writes or wrote, I don't know if he still does, he's old. Um, he was writing stuff that was like, arguing speciation wasn't happening and natural selection wasn't happening so i don't know if he is a young earther but eh, whatever <clears throat> anyway um which cobra says scion oil tried it went home empty-handed yeah <laughs> as expected <laughs> no engineers or dentists on the panel yeah uh um, yeah. if you guys haven't heard of it it's there's this thing called the what is it the salem hypothesis which is like um, anti-evolutionists are more likely to be uh, engineers. Uh, and part of that is a, a function of their field involves making things, like intentionally making things. And so it's hard to conceptually grasp that things are built unintentionally, that they are the byproduct of forces that are not guided, or sorry, no, they're not intentionally guided. They are guided uh, sort of mechanistically. But they, by they can spot forces. intelligent design real well. You're right, exactly. Well, I, <laughs> I looked. I just looked up, and uh, like over ten years ago, Stephen Meyer did uh, a debate uh, on uh, against somebody on climate change, among other topics. Color me not surprised. Color yeah. me not at all surprised. <laughs> I, I, it, it was the it was the author of a book uh, where like it's called the Republican War on Science. Like somebody wrote that book about the, like listing all the the scientific mm -hmm. things like climate change that uh, one mm -hmm. party tends to deny. And Stephen Meyer had a problem with that, so he debated him on that on this. Apparently, apparently. I have a book that sounds sort of like that. It's titled uh, "It's uh, Fighting Back the Right" by David Neos. Um, I have not read it yet. It's on my shelf, but you know, there's not enough time to read everything. But here we are. So, mm -hmm. interestingly, I don't know if you guys have heard, but in the the U.S., um, some uh, representatives from Montana were recently proposing a bill uh, that said only theories could be taught in pre sorry only facts could be taught. No theories. Theories are not allowed in pre collegiate schools. Oh well, yeah, I have seen it too. <clears throat> Yeah, so it's ridiculous. If you were if you were wondering at all what the state of education is in in America, um, there's a little little drop for you. Yeah, can't teach gravity. Um, we were trying to. You can't teach gravity. You can't gravity. teach cells. You can't teach atoms. You can't teach that the Earth goes around the sun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I don't know what what they would teach in science class, like the scientific method. Well, if you do that, it just ends up producing theories. You know, yeah. I, don't, I don't even know. Anyways, that's, com the, that's computer the, the, science the, the, out the door the, too, this, because there is, is there is the, that theory of electronics. Uh, <laughs> what were you saying, Nestle? Well, this is basically the uh, so-called methodology that flat earthers tend to adopt. That they will say like, "Oh, we, we don't do theories; we just do observations, and then make the conclusion mm -hmm. from the observation." And that's how right. that's, that's it. That's all. But yeah, basically. Basically, a very, very, a very uh, simplistic notion of how you do uh, epistemology. Yeah. Yeah. The funny it's, thing about the yeah. Well, the funny thing about that law is it defines theory as speculation. Right. It says a fact is like an observable, repeatable. It's very close to like some AIG writing, but it defines fact uh, is like you know it's a testable, observable, repeatable. A conclusion that we can reach, uh, whereas a theory is speculation. It's like, well, if you're defining theory as speculation, then you say you can't teach speculation. Then, like, I guess under that, under your definition, evolution is just a yeah. fact. I guess yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, it would just mean we can't teach hypotheses, like uh, or competing hypotheses, which, or, or or even even they may not count as speculation, even. So yeah, sure, right. Yeah. yeah, because, I mean, no one's just, like, throwing out hypotheses like, oh, well, this could be the case. I don't have any evidence to support it, but it could be. Like, yeah, you know, no one's doing that, 
right? Well, of course, the guy, of course, the guy behind behind this bill didn't the, the, doesn't think like that. He thinks like, oh, there are some theories who are clearly speculation, and then uh, we, we can we can we can all guess which ones he has in mind. Right, Netflix. Right, exactly. You you yeah. should have stopped with he doesn't think. <laughs> Anything <laughs> after that is just superfluous. I mean, yeah, the the next video that which will be coming out very soon uh, on on this channel. Um, it's also going to concern um, this topic of of legislators, predominantly from a certain aisle, trying to legislate science. So get ready for that. It'll be fun. Um, oh, boy. Alrighty. Preamble aside, I guess uh, we ready to, to yes. jump in That's a giant the... sack of phalluses. I... Sorry, we don't take drinks here for, for that. I'm sorry. That's only on Dapper's channel. Yeah. Uh, so I did. I did uh, put it uh, a little bit further back so we can have the context of what was next, just right after we stopped. So uh, we're we're going to see a few seconds that we saw in the last show, but okay. let's let's get to it. And so the the Cambrian explosion itself has been differently dated, but increasingly the, the, uh -huh. the date that David used of 70 million years is a very generous date for it. The, 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 age, the age range is actually narrowing as a result of additional findings. Uh -huh. It's now about 10 million years is the increasingly accepted uh -huh. date. And uh -huh. there uh -huh. are yep. major sure. explosions oh, in oh, one Chinese I mean, seam. There's 13 I keep referring to, to a paper that's uh, like two decades old. Groups. Of animals that have arisen in yep. a five to six million year window. It's, Almost it's three decades, abrupt, actually. Geologically, yeah. when you consider Almost the decades. age of the Earth is four and a half billion years, it's also very abrupt biologically because mm -hmm. there's a mathematical branch of Darwinian theory called population <clears throat> genetics. Which that none of you are. to calculate how much, how much change, evolutionary change, we ought to expect in a given amount of time if we know things like the mutation rate, the generation. Uh, not ex eh, sort of, but. I, I it, want to make really, a, it's more I can't, oh sorry go I, ahead. yeah I stopped it because I want to make a comment because I'm I, I have a form of ADHD and I just see things you know not always squirrels but other things as well so okay th there's this guy who looks like like somewhat like like Emperor Palpatine and he's going for a <laughs> look to to be on television. And he combined uninterested uh, uh, adolescent with, I, I think, um, uh, Malfoy from uh, Harry Potter, <laughs> and 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 the clothes of, of Larry the Cable Guy. What's with the ripped off sleeves of that jeans <laughs> jacket? The funny I, thing is, like Berlinski in everything else he's in is like always wearing a suit he's always wearing a suit and so to see him in this weird biker uniform outfit it's like it's very strange maybe he just but yeah as dalton says jean, jean jacket doesn't look like he knows where he is no geez he it, well, maybe I, I, he I, went to a raid was... just before he he showed up here i mean <laughs> we don't know but i'm still That's expecting true. him to screw off that that of his cane and pull out his wand and start cursing people the way the way he looks most of the time it's it's just such a bizarre outfit to to go on tv and then the way he sits in the chair I, but yeah might everybody be else is also wearing suits so yeah it also really sets them uh, oh go ahead what are you saying I, I, I was just going to say like i would actually uh uh Praise him for non not conforming to the gendered expectation of wearing a suit. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> and at least he 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 gets a plus points for me for for that. I guess. I mean, you know, they can all wear whatever they want, and we yeah, we yeah. have a um, you know, an idea of what we think people should look like on TV. And yeah, he can wear. It. He's like what eighty, isn't he? Something like that. He's pretty old, so at this point, he probably doesn't yeah. care all that much. Yeah. So, no. Oh, I'm I'm 60 and and I can get away with a lot of things that I couldn't get away with 10 years ago. Now they say hey, he's yeah. old. He's slowly losing it. Yeah. I mean, let him do what he wants. You know, if yeah. he wants to eat yeah. uh, cake for breakfast, go ahead and let him have it. Yeah. Um. However, I do want to say, uh, actually, I do. I, I kind of want to hear where the point that um Meyer was making. Yeah. I want to see where he goes with that before yeah. we respond. 
Okay. Short of time, the right. population sizes. And uh, five, 10, even 70 million years is a blink of an eye in terms of those, the calculations that can be made for what are called waiting times. And the expected waiting times for the mm, amount of change no. that's evident <laughs> in Cambrian blow out the time scale, if you will. They're Are, hundreds of millions or billions of years. So this is a really unexpected event, both biologically, mathematically, and geologically on a Darwinian view of things. All right, back to all David right, Galerian. Are we move from Okay, so all of that's lies. Just all of it. It's all <laughs> lies. Um, for one, is it geologically sudden? Sure. But the rocks don't care. So, you know, what is it? Why does it matter? Is it biologically sudden? No. <laughs> As we all know, I mean, yes, a mere 70 million years, blink of an eye, right? Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of these organisms at this time were small, right? They were, they're like a few centimeters long. The largest thing was like Anomalocaris, which was a couple of feet long. Pretty much everything else was mere centimeters. Organisms today that we're aware of, the vast majority of them, when they're that big, have lifespans of like a year or less, you know, maybe a couple years at max. So these are organisms that maybe they have multiple generations within a year. So if we're talking about a span of 10 million years and you have multiple generations within a year or just one generation a year, that's fine. We're still talking about millions of generations, right? That's, that's a lot biologically. That's a lot of, of evolution that could potentially occur. But also, um, Meyer's character characterization of population genetics is correct. Um, the field basically allows you to um, assess like how long it should take for a mutation with a given um, like selection coefficient to proliferate through a population of a certain size, right? How long would that take? <clears throat> well, you can do that kind of stuff with population genetics and lots of other stuff. But that's one of the things you can do. Now, Meyer's argument, which is based on an argument B he made and other yeah. ID proponents have uh, made. The Dorothy Schmidt, Schmidt uh, right? The Dorothy Schmidt paper, probably the, the, the waiting time. Uh, oh, paper. right. Um, yeah. Right. So, well, well, well they were. Going to that. Well, they were picking it apart, right? With regard yeah, yeah, to. Right. Um, well, we'll get to that. So, the waiting time problem is, in essence, this idea that if you need, like, mutations to occur yeah. right yeah. if you need a combination of mutations to occur the time that it will take to get those mutations in the order you need them to generate whatever phenotype becomes so enormous that it's it, it essentially will never happen right mm -hmm. and so the the waiting time problem takes it is it's bad it's very bad um it's the math if you do the math if you uh set it up you basically, you have, like, you're, you're using generation times for diploid organisms, but your population is like a single asexual organism that gives birth to a single asexual individual, that gives birth to a single asexual individual. That's basically what the math implies, is you have a population mm -hmm. of one that does not do recombination. It's just asexual reproduction over and over and over. Given that, how long would it take for this suite of mutations to all occur? And it's an incredibly long time. Well, sure. If that's the proposition, then sure, it's going to take a very long time. But one, we're not dealing with a single individual. We're dealing with a population. And two, recombination is a thing that exists. So if, you're, if your mother has a mutation... And your father, you know, a beneficial mutation. Your father has a beneficial mutation, then they mate, right? And then you have right. an individual who has, well, potentially who has both of those mutations, right? So you could have an individual who has both of those beneficial mutations, one, the one for each one. And the waiting time problem just kind of doesn't take that into account. In fact, it explicitly denies that recombination happens, which is bonkers. It's completely bonkers. Now, there are a few papers that the ID uh, crowd has put out, actual scientific papers that have been accepted into journals that are about the waiting time problem. However, these papers inevitably end up in like the Journal of Theoretical Biology. The reason is 
the journal the the uh the peer reviewers check the math but not the biology so they look at the math and they say, yeah. "Yes, okay, according to these parameters." G yeah, would given take... the assumptions, this this uh, right. conclusion is correct. But of course, the assumptions right. need to be challenged. Yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. The assumptions are bogus, and so they're not going to check that. But then the ID proponents turn around and say, "Aha! Look, we got a paper in an actual scientific journal. Well, one a, a journal that has like a pretty low." Yeah. Um, uh, what is it? Uh, the, the, the paper you're referring to that was like Michael B with uh, how, another guy, I think. Uh, was it? I don't know. I don't know. Was it like Snoke or something like that? Yes, yes, yes. Snoke, yeah, Snoke, yeah, yes. Yeah. He and Snoke, yeah. Yeah. And, and, then, and, then Mike, and then Michael Lynch responded to that one. Yes. Also, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Um, also, like Michael, uh, Michael, uh, and also Dirt and Schmidt, like Dirt Schmidt's main. Focus was Behe's uh, book, uh, Darwin's Box, uh, Black Box, right? Uh, I think it was Edge of Evolution. Oh, oh yeah, oh, yeah, 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 you're right. The Edge of but, Evolution. Um, and, and, he, and he made like yeah. a side remark on uh, on the Behe and Snoke paper on, uh, at some point yes. also. Yeah. Yeah, with the Dirt and Schmidt paper, one thing they were looking at. Oh, okay, because that's another thing. Another assumption of the waiting time problem is that you can only generate a phenotype through these mutations. Right. So you this have one a... thing I also want to mention. Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. So you have a single set of of mutations that can generate this phenotype, and so what the waiting time problem assumes is you have a target sequence that you have to get to. Evolution, of mm -hmm. course, doesn't work that way. There can there's be no pre, there's no predetermined goal. Like uh, if you again, if you if you follow a. Uh, Gould's logic if you turn back the clock and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, replay the tape of life then perhaps you get a very different end result right exactly and so um, with because remember um, mutation as we all know from uh, from the um, oh no it's I'm losing it uh, that that experiment where they showed that mutations occur stochastically with respect to selection Oh, dang it. What's the name of that? It was done in, like, 1942. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, can you repeat it again? The um, experiment that showed that mutations occur stochastically with respect to selection. Oh, I I, I, I know what you talk about. I they think, like, uh, like some, 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 some guy, uh, like, put some bacteria or, or, or some bacteria yes. into the dishes, and I, I, I know. But I, I don't remember the name of it. Uh, I, I always forget it. <sighs> Dapper's normally there in the side chat. He'll remember. Anyway, mm -hmm. anyway. Um, so yeah. So mutations occur uh, stochastically with respect to selection. What that basically means is selection is not causing mutations to happen in any particular order. This is, uh, you know, they're just happening. Um, and so, yeah, you're right. If you rewound the tape, would would you uh, have the same result? Well, probably not. Um, and. Uh, so another thing is, it's there isn't necessarily, or there probably isn't just one, one genotype that results in this particular phenotype. So with the Dirt and Dirt Schmidt um, paper showed, right? Is that like, it's not. Uh, wait, no, they did the one with the fruit flies, where they were like, it it would actually take only like sixty thousand years to get this promoter region or whatever. Um, well, basically, you, you can have multiple genotypes that all result in the same phenotype. You don't, it's not just uh, one. Lieder, Liederberg? I think right, huh? Liederberg. No, that's not, that's not the name. That's not the one oh. I'm thinking of. I mean, that may be, that's probably one of them, but that's not the one I'm thinking of. Uh, um, it, it, like in 1952, Esther like, and Joshua Liederberg performed the experiment. Um, that's not the one I'm thinking of. It was maybe it the was different like, experiment the then. It was the 40s. Mm. Um, you know what? I'm gonna have to look it up now. That's okay. Uh, All right, like, I'll mind. see if I can find it in a little bit. But, but so yeah, you don't necessarily have just one target sequence, but yeah. also when you introduce recombination, that also drastically cuts down your waiting time. So basically, all the assumptions. Luria Delbrook. There we go. Luria Delbrook. Ah. That's what it is. Um, but yeah. So basically, when you, when you um model populations realistically instead of with uh, the crazy assumptions of the waiting time problem, suddenly all of the problems disappear. 
and it really doesn't take that long for evolutionary change to occur. But also, one thing I would like to know, or I would like for you know these guys to figure out is like how many changes would it require to go from one organism to the other, right? Um, they apply the waiting time problem. Um, obviously, we can't do that for like arthropods, uh, these all these extinct arthropods. But we could we could do it, you know, like uh, with whales and hippos, right? What was the common sequence for whales and hippos, and how long would it, you know, figure out what the the sequence their common ancestor would have been, and so how many mutations would you have needed to go from one to the other, right? And they don't mm -hmm. do anything like that. They never do anything like that. They're just kind of like, oh, well, it would take, it would in theory take this long for this many mutations to occur. Yeah. More it's, mutations it's, it's than that occur within like lineages within the same species of organism. So clearly it wouldn't take that long. All right. Go ahead. I, I, I also could do the same uh, probability calculation, but, but like uh, determining how likely it is for me to have born like uh, oh i have a certain recombination of uh, chromosomes mm -hmm. for my parents uh let, let's calculate how what, what the likelihood is of for this particular combination to have been produced by, by, by my two parents uh, reproducing oh it's a very very small probability and if i do the calculation i can perhaps obtain a uh, waiting time for many millions of years so right do this my, par my parents had to re be reproducing for many millions of years for me to have been born right right exactly yeah yeah no it's just the waiting time problem is dumb uh dan Stern cardinal did a really good video picking it apart um all the major like tenets of it uh we discussed it when we did our video response to lss because he's an idiot and he also of course put it out there um uh, so yeah all righty I guess we can move on. Right. Unless there's anything else, Nestle, you want to add? I guess we can move. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think I have uh, said enough. Like, uh, like it's the main, the main thing is forgetting other possibilities that weren't realized. Like, uh, for example, mm -hmm. like I just made my the example of uh, me uh, being a unique recombination of uh, chromosomes from of my parents. Mm -hmm. But you need to bear in mind that, that there were many other potential siblings that could have been uh, realized that there weren't. Like I was really lucky, basically. But of course, if you go back, if you turn back the clock, perhaps a different person would have been born in my my place. That's that's the that's the, the the one thing that they don't take into account when they calculate the waiting time problem, or at least one of the things that they they uh, mistakenly omit. That's the whole thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, moving on. Yep. All right, let's go. The fossil record, I'm coming to you. Go nowhere. I'm patient. Oh, thank you, David. David Galanter. Darwin's main problem is molecular biology. The thing uh, that didn't exist in his day? <laughs> me, but I'm going to continue quoting your essay and then ask somebody to unpack it for this layman here, for this layman who can't tell a cat from a dog. It's okay, they're all laymen. Species. I'm, 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 treat me as a very slow student. Uh, I, I, so a layman who can't tell a cat from a dog. Sorry, that a layman who can't tell a cat from a dog. That's what he said. That's what he said. Okay, he, he, I must have missed it. He's okay. a layman who can't tell a cat from a dog. Yeah, I, okay. I, I well. doubt that that's the case. But let's continue. Quoting. What, I'm quoting you, what does generating new forms of life entail? Many biologists agree that generating a new shape of protein is the essence of it. Argument step number one, argument step number two, and inventing a new protein means inventing a new gene. Eh, wrong. You wanna give me the, the, the overview on that one? Steve is the real The non-biologist? Life means new life, new form of life, Means wait, 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 hold on. Means wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry, I spoke. Peter, can you go back like 20 seconds? I, uh, I need to... Doing, doing he just again. said something. <laughs> I heard him say Meyer something biology. I want... I missed it. I'm, I missed what he said. Okay, you're right there. I'm sorry, I'll stop speaking. Life <laughs> means... No, nope, that was life, it. New uh, form that, of that life sentence means that new... he just said. Yeah. Yeah. Just a few moments back. Yeah, okay, back. pause. Pause right there. Yeah, okay, go. You want to give me the, the, the overview on that one? 
Steve is the real biologist. Right. And I life, means no, new life, I, new. Form. <laughs> He said Steve is the biologist. Steve is not a biologist. Steve is a philosopher. He has zero training in biology. Zero. Zero training. Steve is not a biologist. Good lord. I was... I thought I heard him say that, but I was like, wait. No. He didn't just say Steve is a biologist. Oh my god. No. <laughs> um, okay, now let's let's talk about that stupid claim for a moment. The idea that you need a new gene for a new a new protein. Um, mm -hmm. Well, first of all, it's not necessarily about it's not producing a new protein. You can produce a if you duplicate. I mean, if you have a, a new gene that produces a new protein, but it has the same function as it's the same shape and has the same function as another protein, then you haven't really done anything. Um, no, the thing about when they say new protein, they mean a new function, that this protein has a new function. You don't need a new gene to get a new function. You can mutate existing genes to get new functions. Now, an example that Dapper and I gave when we uh, talked to a creationist recently is the antifreeze glycoprotein that ice fish have. So uh, there are these fish that live in the Antarctic uh, and they have these antifreeze proteins in their bloodstream. But the antifreeze protein is a duplicated, is a, it's a many times duplicated um, uh, segment of a gene that uh, was copied from a, um, from a pancreatic protein. So this, so the gene in this, in the pancreas uh, produces a protein that it's called trypsinogen so it breaks down trypsin in the pancreas uh but in the but a sec a little segment of it it's like three codons long uh was copied and then moved to an another location and then it was copied many times over it's like 40 times over it's a crazy amount and what that little segment does is it generates a protein that prevents the formation of ice crystals in the bloodstream <clears throat> And so, yes. and so, um, that's a new function. That's a totally new function. It is not breaking down trypsin anymore. It is preventing yeah. ice crystal formation. So that's a new function from an existing gene. What'd you say? Oh, I was just saying yes. And also, the, like the like the, uh, the 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 protein it evolved from. The trypsinogen protease, right? So that, mm -hmm. that 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 enzyme is produced by the pancreas, and right. also the antifreeze is also produced by the pancreas, which is first secreted right. into the intestines and then reabsorbed into the bloodstream, which is an mm -hmm. interesting uh, way of how how it uh, has inherited this uh, peculiarity from the uh, protein it evolved from as well. Because everything in evolution is jerry rigged. Right, you, yeah, you can't yeah. you can't start over, um, you can't just start over, make a totally new, you know, gene, organ, whatever from nothing. There has to have been something there to start from. So everything is like built on top of something else, <clears throat> and you end up getting these like Rube Goldberg, um, you know, contraptions in the <laughs> body where it, where this one metabolic pathway requires like thirty different you know, proteins, like, why on earth would you need 30 proteins to make one little product, which could, you know, be done with like two steps? Well, the body can't do anything else. It has to keep building on what already exists. And the, the creationists are always like, oh, well, because it takes 30 steps, that means it's, it's so complex. It could never have evolved. You don't need these steps. It's, it's like, you have to type on another computer to like send it to a different computer right it's 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 you're you're making way more steps than you have to it'd be like making you know building an assembly comp an assembly line complex to like build stuff to send to another assembly line complex why why not just do it in one why would you have to send it to another one it doesn't make sense it, it's all this like you know handing the baton off to somebody else yeah, yeah. who hands the, the I, baton I, off I, to somebody imagine, else. imagine it Imagine an uh, automobile assembly line that uh, mimics uh, the, the Calvin cycle. <laughs> you know <Right>. what? 
I put the knees yeah, and this together and I'm breaking apart again and I put the knees to these two together and I'm breaking apart again and, I'm, and such and such. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's complicated because it's stupid. Yeah. Right? It's it's all a matter of chemistry. When you look at like the um, the uh, 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 electron transport chain, right? You have yeah. your high energy electron and then each of your um, complexes has to be like increasingly more... Um, electronegative because your electrons losing energy as it's going so each one has to be more electronegative than the last one to keep attracting the electron it's like okay. why do you need to go through all this nonsense it has to go through like five different complexes before it gets handed off to um to uh uh the final uh acceptor you know before it gets moved over to to uh, uh yeah, if, although although in in this in, like, in this case like the the, the length could be explained by the use of oxygen. Like oxygen is a very electronegative, or like right, it's, it's the most hungry, electronegative, it's which is why it's the yeah. final acceptor. You, you, you can you can you can make a you can make it very long and then use the all the energy available from the electron before it lands in oxygen. But then, yeah. then of course, then you have other organisms where the uh, the transport chain is a bit shorter and they use mm -hmm. different except electron acceptor. Right. Yeah. Like uh yeah. like elemental sulfur or something right. like that. Yeah, it's you, just you missed. You both missed one thing. Oh, Dalton, Dalton in the chat mm -hmm. got it. He said, "What? Did he just get asked about his own quote and then deflect Stephen Meyer?" Oh, I saw that. Well, I thought that was really? funny. <laughs> oh yeah, he did. Yeah, because he the guy asked Galerner, <laughs> and Galerner said, "Well, Steve's the biologist. Well, yeah, <laughs> it's your quote." I didn't notice that. This is really funny. It's really funny. Right, it's, yeah, it's like, it, you said this, sir. What What do you think? <laughs> Why are you even here? Like, uh, I know we invited no biologists, but still, why are you Why are you specifically here? <laughs> also, Steve's first response should be, I'm not a biologist. If he has <laughs> any honesty in his body whatsoever, his first response should be, I am not a biologist. Well, let's see. Let's yeah, see uh, yeah, let's see what he says. Form of life means new protein, means new gene. Well, I'll, I'll explain it in, in terms that would be familiar to David. If you want to give and a he didn't say a new it. function, right, a new program for it to accomplish a new function, you've got to give it new code. And the big discovery of 20th century biology, following Watson and Crick, and what's now called the molecular biological <laughs> the revolution, is the same thing, thing as true analogy life. Again. You want to invent a new form of life, you've got to have, you've got to have code in the form of the information inscribed along the spine of the DNA molecule, and we're learning, and other forms of information. So you need the information to build the... Can I, can I just object to the wording there? If you want to invent a new form of life, new forms of life aren't invented. Well, sure. Right. I mean, you're right. It's stupid. It's intentionally vague when he says a new form of life. It's not, it's like, like it's popping out of the ether. Like, no. Anomalocaris and Opabinia and Morella and, you know, Hallucigenia, all these guys that are in the Cambrian, Meyer talks about them. He's like, wow, look at all these cool, weird things that pop out in the Cambrian. He shows you all these organisms and then says, because they're new organisms, they require new genes, new DNA, all this new stuff. We don't know that. We can't tell that just by looking at the fossils. But what we also know, based on doing studies of actual of extant organisms, is no, that's not true. <clears throat> Much of evolution is repurposing existing things. Now, you can have new genes, like you can, uh, you know, move a promoter and it activates some formerly non-coding segment of a genome okay that happens but that's not uh i would say that's probably overshadowed by repurposing existing genes for new functions i like, like one of the things that eva Devo has shown us is that like very and not always but often it's not that the genes themselves don't change it's their interaction right. which gives to like changes in the body plan and i know, right. I know actually and i know a specific example in uh in plants like uh you know you know that the uh, many flowering plants have uh, these rolls of their uh, flower organs like you have them on the outside you have the, the, the sepals and then you have the, the petals mm. then the stamen and then the carpels the uh 
But then you also have all other more quote unquote primitive flowering plants, which where you only where you only have where the, where the sepals and the petals are not distinguished. You have right. what are called uh, what was the what was the collective term again for these? Uh, oh, the anagrade ones. Uh, also, also, yeah, but you also have like uh, lilies, I think. Uh, yeah, that's all like anagrade because uh, yeah. it's like amborella and um, the austrobiales and nymphales and all those guys. Yeah, I just remember that. Uh, I, it, it, I think it's called uh, uh, teepals. I think teepals. Uh... Yeah, yeah, yes. It's, it's uh, like when the petals and the se the sepals are not differentiated, it's called uh, the sepal collectively. Like I think, uh, like uh, many, uh, also also um, mon monocots, uh, for example. You have also uh, mm, on, I think one good example is the the, the lilies, which are which are monocots, where you have like mm. six six petals but no sepals, and mm. um, they, they are technically. Uh, called tepals because you you don't have a, a differentiated uh, role into sepal uh, sepals and petals. But right. then, well, if you if you, right. but, uh, but my, my my point was uh, to <laughs> explain like what what explains this transition like why why of how, how did the plants differentiate these like one organ into two separate organs? Well, it basically is the uh, what what they, did, what they did is that they evolved a antagonistic interaction between uh, different matchbox genes that control the development of these organs. Ju ju just the interaction, like a very very different interaction that separated these these organs into separate into two separate uh, distinguishable identities. I think you picked a, a very good example with the, the flower because all the mm -hmm. different parts of the flower are just modified leaves. Also, yeah. yeah right? Also. The sepal, the petal, the stamen, the pistil, all of these are modified leaves, right? All these all these different parts. Um now they don't now obviously like you know, you look at a magnolia or or I don't know, freaking uh, a cherry blossom or something, and you look at those petals and you're like, you know, they don't look like leaves, but they are their leaves or they were leaves at one point um and with uh the stamen the part the male part of the flower which you know holds the pollen um if you look at different groups of flowers you can see how this has evolved it used to just be that the the part that makes the pollen was like a segment on a leaf right so with like the uh the amborella and these other really primitive flowers you have like a leaf or one of the the petals that has the like the pollen on it it grows the pollen directly on there mm -hmm. and then you have like magnolias where it's not a leaf anymore it's like it's much thinner right and then you have your monocots and dicots where it's like it's just on this one little top part where you're making your pollen and so you can see that progression as it would have occurred in the actual evolutionary history of flowers right we're right. just seeing that each of these guys are still doing it in their particular way. But yeah, 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 yeah. flowers are a really good uh, example to use because it's it's all about reusing and repurposing existing genes. And now, of course, there were duplications and neo-functionalization and sub-functionalization, all that sort of stuff. But the, it's they're not inventing lots of new genes to do this. These genes were already mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Oh, they, 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 I think, uh, I suspect that they also have evolved new genes alongside sure. it. Sure. But, but, but the, the, the very important ones, like the deep, the, the maddox genes in plants, they, they mostly remain the same ones, maybe duplicated often, but they remain the same role. They maintain the same role, just in a different way. And they, they, they transitioned from a fading borders plan. And like, I have a paper right here. Well, it gives like some examples mm -hmm. where uh, at, at first the, uh, the the mass box genes were uh, they they were patterned out into a fading border, like they 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 fit, the, the pattern faded into each other, and then later you have a strict border, like you know, now now the the genes don't overlap in the same regions. They they have a, mm. like a, like a, once you transition from one organ into the other, there's a strict. Uh, difference in the the expression of these genes and and this strict mm. border pattern changed the identities of these uh, organs, which is a very interesting of how 
Okay. How, how subtle changes can have very, very drastic, how subtle changes in the expression of genes can have drastic consequences on the, the phenotype, basically. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, also, sort of in that vein. Although, like... although I'm, I may be talking over to Stephen Meyer because I'm talking about plants and not about animals because he's interested in the Cambrian. It's episode. okay. Yeah. He doesn't know anything about animals either, so you know it's fine. <laughs> um, his book, I mean, really, if you read it, like he spends a large portion of it just kind of being like, "Wow, look at all of these animals." It's like, yes, those are a bunch of animals. Um, here he says, like, "Oh, these things are just arthropods." These are just chordates. Well, if you look at like Anomalocaris and Opavinia are not arthropods in the same way that trilobites are arthropods, right? Because Anomalocaris and Opavinia are stem arthropods. They're not part of any um, extant groups, right? Like trilobites are crown arthropods. But mm -hmm. Anomalocaris nests outside of crown arthropoda. It doesn't have all the characteristics that define arthropods. Meyer knows nothing about anything. You know, he probably knows about philosophy. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't challenge him on philosophy, but yeah, paleontology, biology, no. No. Mm -hmm. Not not a whole lot going on up there. Um oh well. All right, we ready? Yeah, sure. Okay. The protein molecules that service the, the, the different types of cells, and then you need additional information to arrange the cells into the body plants. Mm -hmm. And so the, the Cambrian explosion is an explosion of biological form, but it's also an explosion of biological information. And that fact gives us a way of grappling with this question that Darwin didn't have, because we know something about what it takes to generate information in our high-tech digital world of computing. Right. I, know, I have to say that David Galerica okay, in his pause. essay goes... The way that, that genes are refunctionalized is, I would say, like almost completely opposite from how code is... Well, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not a big... Oh, it's, also, it's also, they don't, they don't define information. That's very true. I, I'll say that also. I know we have yeah. people here who uh, do computer things in the chat, so I'll be careful with how I say this. Um, mm -hmm. But there is a big difference. At, at the very least, I can say that. There is a big difference between how genes are refunctionalized and how, um, like, code in a program is refunctionalized, right? Um, with genes, you can have, like, you know, mergers, and you mutate it gradually, predominantly. And this generates very slight changes on your... Uh, on your functions but you nobody codes like that right no one makes very slight tiny tweaks and like just keeps kind of very slightly tweaking this and then oh well, i have to change this so i'll duplicate it and then I'll, I'll you know tweak it slightly no no one does no one does coding like that but that's how biology works right um mm -hmm. there is a there was a paper uh about um, like comparative genomics of various animal phyla and it looked at the rate of gene uh, duplication and like gene loss in different clades of animals and what it shows is you have a lot of both right you have genes yeah. being acquired but also genes being lost it's not just everything is gained to make things more complex you have loss also mm -hmm. yeah, it's yes also, he's making I a very also, funny face also... <laughs> yeah, I, I said he's he's okay. pouting because we didn't let him finish. It it, it looks like he's <laughs> just he's going to cry. David, why, why did you pause me at this moment? I'm not happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, one, one point I also want to make I would like to make is that uh, like it's a, it's a very it's a too simplistic assumption to uh, to say like oh if you want to have a new new forms of life then you need also uh, a lot more information but that's actually that's actually also actually what the uh, scientists also wants at one time assumed like they, they assumed that oh with, with very with very, very divergent uh, organisms like for example arthropods and uh vertebrates you, that there would be there would be little commonalities between them because they, they are they 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 they're Phenotype is so different, their genes must be too different too. 
but what we, what we found was that there's actually a lot of conservation, a very deep, deep homology still right. preserved. Yeah. Right. Like, um, oh, well, one instance would be um, like feathers and scales. Now, feathers mm -hmm. are not derived directly from scales, but the feather placode shares uh, homology with like the scale placode. Right. So there is homology at that very deep level. Uh, but then you have these other genes, which are all keratin genes, and most of them are duplicates of each other that are involved in like the building of the feather. Right. Um, same. Uh, what is it? There was like, um, was it the the pathway that makes like beetle uh, horns is also used to make wings? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, yeah. And I think the um, and many, have many different they have many different developmental toolkits that get reused again and again and again, even even for very different organ. Organs. I think uh, yeah. the wasn't it the pathway that made fins also like contributed to making jaws in in vertebrates. Uh, I don't know. I don't know about that, but I do know that hmm. you uh, okay. There's also one example that uh, we put into one of our videos. Like uh, you know, you know that the hawk genes lay out hmm. the uh, the body the body axis right. like from from the front to the back. But you you also have like in in vertebrates the, we have we have uh, several rounds of whole genome duplication, which which, which gave us four sets of hox right. gene clusters, and so, some of these hox gene clusters were repurposed to be used in the development of uh, limbs. Like now now they lay out mm. the pattern right. of our limb from our uh, humerus to the uh, radius and ulna and to the uh, the bones basically, all, all, also in a similar front to back pattern. It's, mm -hmm. it's uh, like reused for for a for a very similar for a very similar task, basically differentiating the segments, basically. But then for a very different part of the body. That's right. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Continue, or should we? Yes, sir. Should, should we point out that there's a, a C to many in the Twitter handle? I think it mm -hmm. should it should be un unknowledge. Un unknowledge. Yeah. <laughs> un un knowledge. No. yeah un not un not knowledge. knowledge. Very easy on Darwin. First, he calls the theory beautiful and says how sad he is to have to dismiss it, and then he says this molecular stuff. Darwin couldn't have known he that. Couldn't have known. nobody. So, if tell me if you tell me if how is that easy on Darwin? In Darwin's time, it was good enough to imagine that the basic unit of life, a cell, was like a little brick of jello. It was an undifferentiated, quite uncomplicated no, thing. No, he did not Imagine putting that. many, many, many of them together and getting no. different forms of life. Is that roughly fair? Yeah, it was good enough for Darwin. It's probably good no. enough for us. <laughs> no. as that's well. not that's what not they true. thought in that that's time, the though. Problem. They knew the cell by the 1850s that that was wrong. Complex bit of machinery. Okay, okay pause sad. for a moment. Peter, pause. Yeah, hey, ahead, it, it's... Of course, it's true. Of course, that, that we know a lot more than Darwin. So, it's, right. it goes without saying. Like, uh, it, it's uh, it, again, it's all, it's all, it's always the case. Like, oh, they, they want, they want to, they want to uh, focus on Darwin as if scientists have not moved on since then. But it's, but aside from it, it's definitely, definitely not true that Darwin thought that cells were basically jello. Like, I, I, even, even his. If you look at his writings on the cell, he, he gives a very detailed uh, description of uh, what is a very crude description, of course, from compared to what we know today. But it's not it's not like he was thinking, oh, it's it's just a blob of jello. No, no. Hopefully nor is not. evolution, uh, nor at any point in his work in like Origin of Species, for instance, does he ever say the basis of my theory rests on cells being little blobs of jello? Like, no. Why? Why this is a a like a contention that keeps popping up in anti-evolutionism? I don't understand, because like nowhere because, is it said by Darwin. Because nowhere. they want to ridicule it. And uh, another thing is that uh, yeah, it was okay for them back in those days because they didn't know what they were talking about. So basically, dismissing the findings yeah. that they did make. Uh, just just in 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 retrospect of what we know now 
Whereas they never do that when it yeah. comes to, to any kind of uh, religious literature, because that doesn't get updated. <laughs> Funny enough, that's still... It was true the day he said it, it's true now. Yes. <laughs> so, and there's, there's always this inference that if, if you weren't right the first time, you're never going to be right. Whereas God obviously right. knew everything was wrong about most of it, but he knew everything, so he must be right. And that's... Yeah. That's part of this dishonesty that I, I strongly dislike. Making it so that if... if okay, if your, your knowledge is going to be updated when new evidence comes in, or when, when you discover new things, then it's going to dismiss everything else you knew before? Of course not. That's that's right. not how this works, and I, I find that inherently dishonest. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, right. continue. Continue. Complex, mm -hmm. and we haven't understood its complexity at all. Every time we look, there seems to be an additional layer of rebarbative complexity that needs to be factored into our theories. Don't forget the 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 eternal yeah, goal is cell to biologists explain don't the do evolution of this complexity. Yes, and if we're continually behind the curve because the complexity is increasing every time we look, that eternal goal is also receding from view. So, I also want to pause here. Let's pause for a moment. I want to point mm -hmm. out that this this uh, contention actually cuts against them because they actually also rely on things being. Uh, less complex than what it actually is. And I'll give you an example. Um, one of the things that these guys are that it has been determined in recent years is that um, the gap between eukaryotes and prokaryotes is actually a lot less than uh, or is, is it's seemingly less all the time than what we previously thought. So inherently dishonest is what ID stands for. Yeah, that's true. Um, so, for instance, it was thought for a long time that no prokaryotes had, like, actin, which is one of the uh, molecules that makes up the cytoskeleton. Turns mm -hmm. out there are there are archaea, which are prokaryotes, that have actin. It was thought that um, there were no prokaryotes that had uh, regions of their cell that were membrane-bound. That's wrong. There are prokaryotes we know now that had membrane-bound regions, where they do... Uh, certain uh, biochemical pathways that they don't do in other regions. So that's their, that's this uh, like delineation of jobs, right? That argument, what that's showing is, therefore, it was less difficult. There were less innovations that had to be made in the evolution from prokaryotes to eukaryotes than what we originally thought. Originally, yeah, I, I think... Like are they? Oh, so, so like uh, it's just uh, mentioning to, we did the video. I think it was cell divisions where we, where we mentioned how uh, where we mentioned a paper of how the uh, cytoskeletal proteins often have homologies with uh, genes found in or proteins found in prokaryotes as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's so this or um or when they argue that or uh, you know. Famously, when they argue that, oh, this thing couldn't have evolved, and then we find, like, a transitional fossil that has the thing, but <laughs> not in its current form. Like, this that that argument ring. cuts... Right. That argument yeah. cuts mm. against them, not us. It cuts against them. Um, if you say you have to have a full wing, and then we find, like, theropods with feathers, uh, but they're not using their feathers for flying. They're using them for thermal regulation and for gliding and, you know, scampering up trees and stuff then your argument's wrong and you need to change. Or if you say, well, you know, what good is half a limb? And we find Tiktaalik. There you go. There's half a limb. It's this, they try to act like this is an argument just for, for us. Like if we don't know how something evolved precisely, then that's a problem for evolution, which it isn't. Uh, but then they also don't take in the data and, process it on their own side because this is apologetics apologetics is about putting out fires it's not about generating actual data they're not trying to make a system that explains the world they're just trying to attack evolution 
They're just trying to to protect their little believers. That's all they exist to do. Whether or not yeah, they I'll, want to admit it. Yeah. Also, uh, do, 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 don't uh, do a drinking a drinking game where every time they say the word complexity, you have to take a drink because <laughs> you will be risking your life. Like in the last <laughs> few seconds, I think I heard the word complexity mentioning like five, four, more than five times just in the last few last few sentences. Uh, yeah, we don't do drinking games over here. Dapper can have all the drinking games. The, the the problem with how these guys talk about it is that they are going at it top down. So they expect that the things we see in animals today, those are the intentional functions. And so there couldn't have been a different function uh, to, to anything before that. Whereas evolution works from the bottom up. It, it right. modifies existing things to perform other functions. And that's that's the part that they mm -hmm. will not acknowledge. I mean, do penguins still have wings or do they have flippers? <laughs> right. I mean, that you could you could make a really good case to say, well, those wings now function as flippers. That's they have, they have, they have both. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think they are both, yeah. So and that's and that's yeah. the problem. And they want to put it uh to to people who, who don't study any of this that that is the problem with evolution. If it didn't have the function from the get go, then you couldn't have gotten there. Because it's all random, right? It's random chance. Yep. Totally random. Yes. Uh, okay. Continue. Yep. Yep. It's becoming more and more difficult to construct the theory for that. All right. Now, somebody give me some notion of the math here. Things are more complicated than... Lol. Than LMAO. <laughs> we understand that producing new forms of life now means not just new shapes, new activities in which life engages, but a prior code, or is that fair? You're the, you're the man who knows uh, code. You know, the, the mathematical element of this, not of population genetics in, in the uh, complex, sophisticated, predictive sense that um, Steve was referring to, but just the simple issue of the code. It is remarkable for young people to learn in high school, it's remarkable for me, or in elementary school, to learn that, that proteins, molecules are assembled because there are codes, there are codes in the nucleus of cells that spell them out, character by character, codon by codon. This codon means this amino acid, and the next one means that, and the next one means that. Yep, but the, that's, but that's the how that works. The mathematics underlying these codons is very simple, and, there, and Darwin- What is the math? Perfectly well have understood if he had the facts. Each one of these what is the math? has to be occupied by one of 20 amino acids. And also we are okay, sure, so sure, sure pick one of 20 guys for this position, and one of 20 guys for this position. You, you like, talk about visualizing a string of beads. Yeah, like okay. a string actually and pause. a protein. Yeah. Right. So, actually pause, okay, so let's, I'm sure they're going yeah, to continue get, expanding on We are getting to the, origins or bust, yeah. <laughs> we are getting to origins or bust, yeah. It always starts with evolution's got a problem, but abiogenesis, you know, yeah. right. Um, the other thing about this is, and uh, when when I co-wrote the script with uh, Professor Dave for uh, the Steve Meyer video, this is something that he talked about in depth. Um, the the whole bit about every codon, which you know corresponds to a particular amino acid, that has to be perfect. It has to be exactly this, followed by exactly this amino acid, followed by exactly this one, and you can have it. It has to be perfect. That's nonsense. It's just utter nonsense. You are completely biochemically inept, right? Um, if you think that's how that works. There are lots of different amino acids that can be swapped out for other amino acids, and nothing at all changes. Nothing at all changes in the protein. So, like, uh, Dave makes the example. If you, like, trade out a random leucine with, like, isoleucine, nothing's going to happen. It's going to stay the same. There's, yeah. there's a thing called uh, alanine scanning, 
where researchers replace uh, the different amino acids in a sequence with alanine. And the point of this is to see which ones are necessary for protein function. So if you replace like, you know, a little side chain or something uh, with alanine, like, is it, does it change anything? It might, or it might not. It depends on where it is, on where uh, this chain is relative to like, um, you know, where, what the, the function of, of the uh, protein is, right? You can't just assume that if you change it, then it's going to ruin it. There's a concept in uh, biology called a non-synonymous mutation. And what that means is you had a mutation which caused a different amino acid to be produced, right? If it's a synonymous mutation, that means you had a mutation, but the amino acid produced is the same. So it's just a different codon for the same amino acid. But if you have a non-synonymous mutation, you have a different amino acid being produced. Mm -hmm. Now, if it were the case that every non-synonymous mutation like completely destroyed the, the function of the protein, nothing would have non-synonymous mutations, right? Nothing could live. But that's not the case. They happen all the time in all of us. We all have non-synonymous mutations. It's just nonsense. Just abject nonsense. These guys are, again, none of them are biologists. None of these guys are even yeah. chemists. They have I, you, no you, idea what they're talking about. You, you, you need to look up uh, protein robustness and uh, look, at, look at a few papers and see, like, oh, there is... Of course, of course, there are there are damaging mutations, but it's not Absolutely. like it's it's not it's not like one replacement and everything falls apart. It's not like right. that at, at all. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. If you there are now with a with certain you know proteins, if you uh, have the wrong non-synonymous mutation, you could like destroy that protein or whatever, cause it to function incorrectly or what have you. That absolutely happens. But the idea that in any case, like, if it's slightly off, it's going to, like, dissemble. No, no, that's not at all how that works. We all, every single one of us individually has non-synonymous mutations. All of us do. It is ludicrous to pretend that, like, we all have the same exact set of, of you know, our genome is exactly the same for every single person. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, this is just so stupid. It's so idiotic. And these guys are being interviewed to talk about a subject <laughs> none of them have any background in whatsoever. Okay. There's also, like, up until so far, there are no specific examples given. Correct. Like, it's all generalities. Yep. Like, Complexity, like, oh, it's all, it's all new it's all forms. Yeah, yeah, it's, New code. It's, it's, all, it's all buzzword, 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 buzzword. <laughs> yes. Yep. Yeah. It's all buzzwords. All right. All right, moving on. Keep going. Yeah. yeah four different colored protein. beads, roughly. I'm, build, I'm building a protein out of amino acids. Yes. And, and I'm doing it by choosing the amino acids one by one by one by one by one. Yes. And I have 20 choices each time. What do you mean you're choosing now, them? If there are several hundred of these things in the string, in the bead, in the necklace. It's a big ne necklace that wraps around your neck 18 times. So there are several hundred, or times, whatever it is. What? What is he talking That's about? That's a huge number of possible choices. The number of ways sure. in which you can arrange the emerald followed by the ruby, followed by <laughs> the no opal, followed that, by the... Look, at what is happening? And another ruby, and another ruby, and a diamond, and a aquamarine, the number of ways you can arrange that is huge, grows exponentially as the, as the string gets longer. So even when the string is short, even if it's a cheap necklace for your very first girlfriend, and it's all you can afford, it still, there's an astronomical <laughs> number of about? choices. And Darwin could easily have computed that. <laughs> He just didn't but know no, about the like, amino acids. What he didn't are we know talking about, about? He didn't know about the string. It's not the mathematics that stumped him. It's the biology. The mathematics is simple. A high school student can compute how many choices there are if there are 20 it, it, gems. Yes, you take a very long time one, to explain this. 20 <laughs> gems number two. And you have 60 gems altogether. And the task here 
Let me point to the sticker. I have a question. Why is he wearing a biker glove? <laughs> I don't know. I also <laughs> saw. I was like, yeah, where'd the glove come from? Is no he? Is he? Glove. Is he the ID equivalent of Michael Jackson? What? What the hell's going on? Is I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I just Every, like, like, no he, one seems just, to know what Galanter's saying. Yeah, like, he, he's just he's just saying that uh, there, are, there are like for, for an average protein of like a few hundred amino acids, there are just like a lot of possibilities. That, that's sure. It. That's, that's all. That's I, all, sure. all he said. That's I all think I if think Dean Wing. Like I think Dean Wing has has it right. If you can't dazzle them with brilliance, baffle them with bullshit. And I, I mean yeah. that's yeah, that's true. But like yeah, I mean if you do like you know. What are what what are the possible like permutations of, you know, a, a sequence of like twenty amino acids just randomly pulled? It's going to be huge. Like, okay, sequence. The sequence What's space is the enormous, relevance? Yeah. yeah. What what is the relevance? No one expects that. Like uh, amino acids are just being tacked on randomly. Uh, it's it's, it's what, the, what? The, the the Douglas Douglas uh, X uh, argument all over again, basically. Right. Yeah. 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 It's like it's just it's nonsense. This is totally irrelevant. Okay. Moving yeah. on. Moving on. Yeah. Your t try to mute. So I'm I'm quoting from your <laughs> even you can <laughs> even I got it. You got it right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm even mathematicians can understand. <laughs> D David, D D this David yes. Belinsky has a memorable phrase to describe this mathematical problem. He calls it the problem of combinatorial inflation. Yes, yes. As the yes. length, of, the required length of the protein molecule grows, again, the numbers irrelevant. grow exponentially. They inflate exponentially, cool. and so the 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 Who odds cares? of a random search finding the, the the one that makes the pretty necklace, to use the, right. other so David's the, metaphor, <laughs> drop precipitously. And in this huge, unimaginably vast universe of possible combinations, the number of combinations that would produce a useful protein is what? Very Exceedingly rare. Exceedingly rare. And this is what we Why did he get so aggressive last, when he said that? <laughs> that, was that, was, that was so aggressive. Also, uh, pause. By, uh, <laughs> this is actually, this, for one thing, that was extremely aggressive. That scared me. Um, but second, uh, this is what uh, Nestle was referring to with the, the Douglas Axe argument. Uh, Douglas yeah. Axe argued that like the odds of finding a functional protein is like it's one in like it's an infinitely small number. Basically, it's so tiny it's ludicrous to even try to calculate it. Uh, he based it on nothing. Essentially, he based it on nothing. Um, the argument is like, if the odds of a protein, uh, forming a, um, or sorry, I'm sorry. If the odds of, of like two, uh, amino acids forming a peptide bond is like one half and you have a protein that's like, what is it? Like 150, uh, amino acids long. Um, then the odds are going to be like, you know, one half raised to the power of 150. And it's like itty bitty. It's a teeny tiny mm -hmm. number. It, again, doesn't mean anything. It means nothing. All these arguments about like abstract math have no relevance. If they have no basis in the data, they have no relevance. But Jackson you say it's impossible to they they want these well, impossible odds. And and so I think um if you go to an analogy, uh Dawkins put it up a long time ago. That you can have the, the, your, the lottery machines. Yes, the slot machines. Yeah, where you have right, hold right. buttons for beneficial mutations. Mm -hmm. Right. That changes your odds significantly. You don't have to wait until all right. of the ma machines strike a jackpot in order to get somewhere. And this is what right. they try to to uh, to hide in in all these these huge numbers. Because you have to make it impossible right. in order for you to have a have a point where ha ha, now it can't happen anymore. Yeah, it's it's uh, a, it's you're right, you're right, Peter. There's there's populations. It's populations of like thousands or millions of individuals mm -hmm. um, who are all you know engaging, or you know, maybe not all of them, but many of them are engaging in 
uh, sexual reproduction, so they have mutations, and then they can be, uh, uh, they can have offspring with other individuals who have beneficial mutations, and then, yeah, right, it's, you're right, they're, they're just ignoring all of this. They're ignoring that they're building these mathematical models that have no uh, relevance because there's no basis in biology it's just a bunch of random numbers and they're like oh look at how big this number is um if you do an experiment where um you know you're like selecting for some protein function right you you're selecting mutants who have like increased function in some protein for whatever reason on their math that shouldn't be possible right on their math, it should take longer than like the universe has existed for more than a handful of mutations to accrue in some gene. Mm -hmm. But if you do selection experiments, which may take like a few months to a few years, whatever, then you get way more mutations than that, which go to fixation in the population. So the if the math does not correspond to reality, the math is irrelevant. So, okay, continue. <sighs> yeah. Before he gets angry again, he was very and angry. Being by like number of MIT scientists, some of whom David knew very well: Murray Eden, Murray Eden Marcia, Marco Schusenberger, and uh, they were the first to see the mathematical problem with Darwinism. They called it the, their conference was called "Mathematical Challenges to Neo Darwinism." But at the, oh. at the time, they could compute the. Oh, um, that's okay. So that, what he's referring to is, again, something he wrote about, is, again, something Meyer wrote about, that Mathematical Challenges to Evolution conference was not about problems with evolution. It was about how to make mathematical models of evolution better. And the reason was, that was a time, it was like in the 70s. So computer technology was like coming onto the scene, and they were trying to figure out how to model evolution uh in silico so in these computer uh programs that's what the conference was about when we when on the channel uh nestling and i did a video uh darwin's confidence part two we talked about this symposium and somebody i think it was a botanist wrote up a like a little article about the symposium and he said like you know okay this this symposium was cool for like computer guys, but it didn't really do much to change evolution as we know it. Like the mechanisms of evolution weren't, that wasn't the problem. It was how do we model evolution in computers? That was what the conference was about. And Myers just kind of lying as he always does, because that's what he does. And didn't, didn't Dawkins make one of the, the early computer models to, to show how evolution works? Uh, Dawkins has made various uh, computer models, uh, like his uh, biomorphs. That's one of them, uh, where he uh, basically the biomorphs thing is like you take a little like a stick, mm -hmm. and you like duplicate each one. So like each different little point. So like you have you know one point here, and it duplicates, and you can like do duplicates from there, and it forms all kinds of cool little things like different like shells and spiders and yeah. bugs and all sorts of stuff. Just from this one little line that you started out with originally. So yeah, you yeah. get all kinds of cool stuff, like Christmas trees, you know. Um, so yeah, Dawkins did really cool. And you can actually, fun fact, you can download the code for the Biomorphs program uh, for like Visual Basic and Java, I think, if I remember correctly. So, yeah. Okay. A number of possible arrangements, but they didn't know at the time how many of the arrangements would result in functional proteins that would do a job in the cell. And so they didn't know, they couldn't exactly measure how hard the search was, would be on a random I don't basis. think we still can. But especially the computer scientists, Murray Eden and others, knew that based on computer science, if, if this is functioning like a, a true linguistic system, uh, it's going to be, it's like, uh, unlikely that you can do a random search and find a, meaning, a meaningful string of characters in DNA that will produce a meaningful protein. Okay. But people didn't know in, in the 1960s. Well, I want to pause for a moment. Early 2000s, there have been a number of different experimental I want to pause measures. for a moment. I don't think 
I don't even know how we would be able to identify the like selection of possible amino acid sequences that would be functional. Like functional in what context? What do you mean when you say they're functional? Like they have any job at all? I don't know how anyone would determine that. We would have to know what all the potential functions of amino acid sequences are, and I don't think we know that. So if we don't know what all the potential functions are, how could we possibly know what the total sequence space is, right? I don't know. Am I off base on that, Nestle? What do you think? Uh, so, sorry, I, I was looking something up for uh, extra, extra commentary. Can, can you repeat that? I, I was just saying, like, I, he's saying that what, what he's about to say is that the, the sequence space um, for generating, like, amino acids that have functions is very small. And I was saying, mm -hmm. I don't even know how we would calculate that because we don't know all of the potential functions that amino acids could even have. What, what do you think right, I'm off base also. on that? What do you think? As was one, as one thing too, like, and, and also like, this is also one of the reasons why, why I was like uh, silent and looking stuff up. Like I know some papers that actually could actually go deep into the origin of the first protein or pept peptides. Now I, I, I need a minute and I will come back on that. Uh, shortly. That's fine. Give me a um, origami Swami makes a, makes a very good point. How would you, tell just from a protein sequence whether it can do a job in a cell exactly right i don't know how that how one would know that based on a sequence i i don't i don't know it's again i think it's just buzzwords i think he's just saying a bunch of buzzwords and you know hoping to to scare the audience Ooh, big scary numbers but i really don't know how they would calculate any of this stuff i don't know <sighs> oh well Anyway, we can move on. ...of the rarity of the functional genes and proteins versus all the gibberish sequences. Right. And for a short, for, for example, just one result, for a short protein 150 amino acids long, the ratio there it is. is one uh, protein that will fold into a, a functional structure for, uh, compared to 10 to the 77th gibberish sequences. So the ratio of functional to non-functional is Again, 1 over how 10 do you know to the 77th power. Okay, so just because proteins are Douglas extremely... Axe calculated it doesn't make it true. Just because that's what Douglas Axe said, that does not make it true. Like, could you tell? Take our take our DNA polymerase. Could you tell uh, by like uh, changing certain uh, amino acids within it that whether or not it would still function as? Uh, polymerase well in our case yeah you probably could you could tell whether it would function as our polymerase um based on that because we talked about like alanine scanning earlier so you can remove certain amino acids and it will still do the uh polymerase uh you know reaction for for us but like would it do that for other organisms because not all organisms have the same uh dna polymerase um uh, enzyme the same DNA polymerase they have different sequences mm. in their DNA polymerase so how do you know if you how would you know if you like took those mutations or any one of those anyone like looked at ours and then look at like that of an African elephant could if you just looked at ours and did the mutations that are necessary to go from that to the you know, polymerase of an African elephant would you know that it would still function as polymerase? Like, would you know that? I don't know. Maybe. I just, I don't know how, how we could do what he's asking us to do. He's mm -hmm. saying these would all be junk sequences, but I don't know how he knows that. I what, do not know. It, it's also, like, it's also an implicit assumption that, like, the first proteins evolved by uh, basically, oh, you make a string of uh, several hundred amino acids and then you try uh, out at random uh, one by one by one and then, and then uh, in a mm -hmm. billion years you get maybe one protein functional pairs. Like it, it's not how it happens. Like if I right. I actually did I actually did a, a recent uh, review of a talk by one of the orange one of the original life researchers with 
Dessel de Race. It's actually also on my channel, the uh, okay. review. And uh, in, in the talk, he mentioned about how the Earth, like, there's, a, there's this thing about the ribosome. This, the structure of the ribosome is organized into, like, uh, like, like an, an onion, basically, where the oldest parts are at the center. Mm. And if you look at and if you look at the uh, the the protein the uh, or the, uh, the the peptides that that, that touch the ribosome or the, or the RNA part of the ribosome, and if you look at the oldest part, the the the, the proteins that touch the oldest parts are are very peculiar. They they don't seem to fall. They they have uh, very, very they, they seem to be the oldest proteins that uh, that babies came around. That's almost it's almost like uh, it's almost, almost like a record of protein evolution. And basically, what mm. they are saying is that the early proteins were not really proteins; they were like short peptides. But because they are short, the sequence space is a lot smaller, and so you have a, a much higher probability mm. of getting a good enough sequence that mm -hmm. could function. And the, and and the, and the and the earlier and the earliest function of the of these early peptides was basically stabilizing RNA, mm. which, which is what they are now doing. They are stabilizing the the, the, the ribosome itself, and they and they became frozen inside the ribosome, and, and that's how the ribosome recorded this early evolution. And I have now, uh, I was ser searching for se several papers. I have now like ten of them, but I will just share uh, two. Just to be to make it easier for okay. uh, any audience members. There we go. This is the uh, uh, it's called Frozen in Time: The History of Proteins, and uh, it, it's one of the authors is uh, Lauren Dean Williams. He's a very big guy on the origin of the of the ribosome. And here is another one by other authors on the uh, the early the early the early uh, peptides that are recorded in the ribosome. There we go. Yeah. All right. That's okay. what I wanted to do. Very say. cool. I appreciate All right. it. All right, I guess we can keep going. Rare. It's very hard to imagine random mutations leading to functional proteins, except that, and here I quote Dr. Galarenter again, but the theory understands that mutations are rare and successful ones even scarcer. Darwinism knows this. To balance that out, there are many organisms and a staggering immensity of time. Your chances of winning might be infinitesimal, but if you play the game often enough, you win in the end. Correct? That's the and theory. And that's the question. Do you play it often enough? There's always an often enough, and the question is, does the history of life with which Darwin was concerned uh, allow you enough chances to make it uh, at all probable? <laughs> let's say, or even possible that you'll hit on one, statistically, that you'll hit on one of those amazingly rare necklaces that folds up into a protein that can be stuck in a cell and actually doing, doing anything. I'm not a biologist, and so I look at this and say, nope. yeah, there ain't, you I'm are. sure there's enough time. You know, there, there's been a lot of creatures on Earth, and life has gone on for a long time, but when biologists look at this and try and nail it down and figure it out, try and make a guess, try and use heuristics to make a guess, like using the, the number of total bacterial lifetime as a measure of the number of total mutations we're playing with. The point is, from whatever angle you come at it, the, the answer is no, there has not been enough time. The, the, the number of throws we've had is eh, wrong. too puny even to talk about. It doesn't even approach puniness. And certainly is nowhere near reasonable. So, so we would get that if we had a reasonable. So, based on time, your bad we math, we didn't. We haven't. So, let me just be very explicit from my little Winnie the Pooh bear-sized mind. You are saying, <laughs> you are saying that Darwin is unlikely to have to be able. To, it's unlikely that species arose the way Darwin said, or you are saying it is impossible. Darwin was just. Mystic. Lovely man, Wait. beautiful idea. There's hardly a difference. Wait, is he saying it, speciation is impossible? Unlikely, impossible. We're talking about odds that are so prohibitive. If you wish to say it's impossible, fine. I'll defend you saying it's impossible. If you wish to say it's highly unlikely, I'll be in your corner as defense attorney as well. But there's no practical difference. It's look like We've known it about these things for way. hundreds of years. You right? get a million monkeys at a wait, million Wait, 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 wait. What specifically isn't happening that way? Are, because on the one hand, it seems like... 
it seems like so Meyer's argument is that all the different critters of the Cambrian explosion couldn't have all evolved in that time period. But the host sounds like he's saying nothing ever could have evolved that way. That's what it sounded like. It sounded like the host oh, that, said that's what he said. Speciation. Okay. It's and, not just and okay. Berlinski he confirmed say, that that if you want to say it is impossible right. for that to happen, I will defend your position. That's what he said. Yeah. It is it is impossible per natural selection for new species to arise, is mm -hmm. is what he said. Yeah. And then Berlinski defended him on that. Okay. So I don't even I really don't even know what to say about that at this point. Um we witnessed natural selection operating in populations leading to the formation of new species. Like that's a thing we've seen with our eyes. It happens. <laughs> I don't I don't even know what to say. Um sometimes new species arise in a single generational bound. That's a thing that happens. It's called polyploidy or reticulate evolution depending on uh, which way you're going. But uh, so you can get hybridization between two species leading to a third new species, a secret new species. Uh, or you can get one species that, um, you know, has a, a like whole genome duplication or something like that, or, you know, aneuploidy, whatever. And that results in a new species arising. That happens. Um, we've witnessed the formation of new species like within a few decades right or, or you know organisms we've, we've been using it as long features. as we as long as we've been engaging in agriculture we've been using right yeah. the mechanisms through through uh, uh artificial selection to come up mm -hmm. with with new species i mean a lot of our food is man-made right exactly so. Yeah, corn, like uh, regular, uh, you know, a lot of wild, like teosinte, looks very little like the corn that you put on your mm -hmm. table. Yes. Right? Uh, dogs, your little yappy chihuahua, does not look like a gray wolf. I've seen gray wolves up person, or up close in person. Um, they're also very fun to pet, by the way. But they don't look very much like a little chihuahua. Um, you know, your your beef cow doesn't look like a wild cow. Um, the same one of my of like, you know, one of my know, favorites apples, is oranges, is the one nails. that is the one that uh, Kent Hovind stumbled upon, uh, saying, "Well, yeah, God created broccoli." Ooh. Ooh. Oh, that's right. Yeah, no stem from the wild mustard plant, and that's where we also get cauliflower and and uh, mm -hmm. several and other kale, things. Kohlrabi, yeah, Gailon. yeah. So. Yeah, and the fun thing about broccoli is, yeah, you get lots of things like the wild mustard. Um, you get uh, a lot of different uh, vegetable, you know, produce uh, plants from the mustard, like like broccoli and cauliflower and kale and all those guys. They're all from that same plant, just based on different um, selecting for different features. Like you're either selecting for the flowers or the stem or you know whatever mm -hmm. but yeah or the leaves right in the case of kale um yes chihuahuas are are gray wolves but they don't look like your wild gray wolves is what i said and i'll defend that um so yeah i don't even know their argument has really gone from kind of uh, from like sort of meyer's position of i don't think the phyla could have evolved from or, you know, share a common ancestor too. I don't think species share a common ancestor, which is like, like that's a position not even creationists will will argue for. But here these intelligent design guys are kind of defending it. So, <sighs> all right. We can well, going. and Jackson, you, you, can, you can say this is hard to get through, but... Um... Earlier today, I watched a video that I wasn't aware of. Did Did you know that Arn Ra was on Jesse Lee Peterson's show? Oh, no. Talk about painful. Why would he do that? Talk about Why painful. Why would he do that? And, and so, and people say Arn is aggressive. I I would have, I would have 
responded so so differently to the things that happened on that particular show. I I really would. I mean, the fact that Arn kept his cool during that. He's he's a better man than I am. Mm. But I I um I've seen some of his stuff uh and he's just insane. He is. Uh, Peterson is he's just insane. Um it's kind of sad honestly. I don't know how much of it is like, you know, real, how much of it is just for show. I, I don't but he seems like genuinely insane. So well, anyway. on, what I didn't expect is that he showed uh, links to Arn's blog and to Arn's Patreon. So that was he oh, scored sure. he scored a few points with that. But no, yeah, I, I, yeah, no, I'm sure uh, as a as a good host, he'd want to link to whatever his opponent you know said. Hey, here my thing, link to it. But hmm. but right, it, it, it I watched it and it was amazing to say. Amazing, yeah. <laughs> All of them yeah. typing at random. We know they're not going to produce the collected works of Shakespeare and anything like a reasonable amount. More analogies. Like that we will never episode of The ever. Simpsons. Do you remember it? Mr. Burns has a million monkeys typing in a million typewriters. <laughs> they're going to produce the greatest novel ever written. He pulls out one sheet of paper and says, "It was the best of times. It was the blurst of times. <laughs> it was the best of times. It was the blurst of times. You stupid monkey. <laughs> stupid monkey." <laughs> <laughs> or to, to put the discussion down even lower, the Jim Carrey film where he's. Uh, uh, Are we going to ever, ever actually talk the, about data? Lady, he... Yeah, I, I like it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I read you. Here's a person. Okay. I have to apologize mm. to the people who are watching for some stupid reason. It said that my OBS disconnected and has now reconnected so if you missed a part my apologies i have no clue why that happened oh did they i didn't even see it oh okay a apparently we, we are still live so it's still working nice way of okay. uh, uh, yes uh, 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 cashing out this probabilistic <laughs> argument stick argument if you have one over 10 to the 77th power is your ratio but then you have all if every organism in the history of the planet, and we can estimate that about 10 to the 40th organisms. So you define bacteria, bacteria little tiny things, and, you know, everything, every, every mosquito, every, mosquito those, every bacterium. Yeah, every time one of those uh, replicates, there's a possibility for a mutation that could search right. the space of possibilities. So you got 10 to the 40th uh. possible mutations against a, a search space 10 to the 70. Oh, strong. I also forgot right. to point so out. If you do your exponential. Sorry. Here, pause for a moment. I also forgot to point out, every single organism has mutations. When he said mutations are rare, that was wrong. Every single organism has mutations. The mutation rate, however, is way higher than the rate of fixation, the substitution rate. The rate at which you have mutations that enter the gene pool is far higher than the rate at which those mutations become um, fixed in the population, right? And they would have to be because it takes time for organisms to mate and for selection to act. But so no mutations aren't rare. That's it's not it's not true either. There's just there's nothing they're saying which is correct or interesting. All right, we can keep going. <clears throat> Math, you end up with you can what it means is you can search one ten trillion trillionth one ten trillion trillion trillionth of the possible combinations. So cool. in that case, are you more likely to succeed or fail? You're overwhelmingly more likely to fail to find one of the functional combinations, uh, even taking into account every organism that's lived on Earth. And that's, that, that means that the, the Darwinian hypothesis is overwhelmingly more likely to be false than true. Oh my gosh, didn't have nobody, oh, one last nobody, why did none of these biologists ever think about this? Why is it that I, a random philosopher with no background in biology whatsoever figured out this thing that none of the population geneticists ever thought about. Could it be I'm just an idiot who also doesn't understand this subject? No, it's impossible. I'm this smarter is, than them. This is uh, conspiracy theorists 101. 
Yeah. I know it's, it. it really I know comes it. Comes down. No, none of the people who actually work in the field know about this, but I know it because right. I found something on the interwebs. Yeah, I mean it. It really comes down to I'm just smarter than all of them because I say so. Yes. Like, if if you have no background. And you think you know more about this field than all the people who've spent their lives doing this and they've done it for the past century. Maybe consider you're just the idiot and you just don't know anything like. It's possible. It's totally possible. Consider for all of our sakes that that is, in fact, what's happening. <sighs> okay. We can continue. Uh, piece of the argument here that you mentioned. There are other pieces in this book, of course, and in David's book. Um, but here's one last tweet that, that you mentioned in your essay is compelling to you, David Gilertner. To help create a brand new, and this is the, the, the question of mut mutations proving harmful at least as often as useful, if I have it right. To help create a brand new form of organism, a mutation must a affect brand a brand new form that does its job early and in the development of the life form, and the, controls the expression of other genes that come into play as the organism grows. Evidently, there are a total of no examples in the literature of mutations wait, that affect wait, early development and wait, the body plan. Pause. <clears throat> there are no examples in the literature of mutations that affect early development and the body plan as a whole and are not fatal. <sighs> that's not true even within the organisms that Meyer at least accepts are related so if you think about echinoderms like sea urchins for instance sea urchins vary quite a bit in their early development and yet they're all related because they're all echinoderms. So they obviously have mutations that affect their development, which were not all fatal. Okay, we understand how that argument works. If you accept that all vertebrates are related to each other, that also has to be true. Right? Like... When you say affect early development, what do you mean in affect the body plan as a whole? If your development is slightly different, odds are you're probably going to do just fine. You're not, you're, things aren't going to be that bad. If you like break something, break a gene or something, yeah, that might be bad. But if you like change the timing of expression of something very slightly, that's probably not going to be a problem. Like think about axolotls, for instance. Right. The the mutation is they don't produce uh, iodine containing hormones, so they don't metamorphose. So that is. Um... <laughs> I'll read that one second. Um, so axolotls are um, they had a mutation that affected their development. And obviously their body. But wasn't that big of a deal. Uh, Smitty says, urchins are actually polyphyletic. Land urchins are technically just orphaned old world monkeys with cockney accents and not closely related to sea urchins. I am certain that is 100% true. Um, I just, it's such a bad argument. This is such a terrible argument. <sighs> In the fossil record, you can look at organisms that display uh, what are called uh, either paramorphoclines or pedomorphoclines. You can basically see in a lineage how over time they became more either pedomorphic, so they either reduced the development of something or they increased its development. That's paramorphosis. So like ceratopsians, for instance, increased the development of their horns and frills, right? The very earliest ceratopsians, like um, Yinlong and Cetacosaurus, had no horns and 
essentially no frills. But over time, both the frill, you know, got larger and larger, and the horns got longer and longer. <clears throat> so that that is those are mutations that would have affected their development and their body. The body plan thing uh, for like the difference between arthropods and uh, uh, like velvet worms, Onica forens, the difference is largely like the number of segments involved. If you look at early arthropods, they had lots and lots of segments. And early Onica forens had legs, whereas um, the early arthropods didn't. They had little uh, like fins, basically little lobe fins. I just, this is, they're not even trying. Like, we put in so much work to, like, read, you know, books and papers, and they don't even try. They do not try. In, in all fairness. It makes me mad. In all fairness. Uh, there, so, on screen, you can't see the logo still. It says Hoover mm -hmm. Institute. You know what a Hoover is, right? Yeah. The device that collects garbage. <laughs> is, is it? Sorry. I still a good name choice. I think I think it is. I mean, well, that's the thing, Origami Swami. If when we talk about harmful mutations, we're talking about ones which produce evident harm, right? There are lots of mutations you have which produce essentially, uh, which don't produce evident harm, if any harm at all, right? There are lots of neutral mutations, and there are some mutations that are going to produce like ever so slight, like differences that aren't noticeable right it doesn't even if, even if they produce a difference it's so small it really doesn't matter or if it or if there is a difference it's in some process where that minor difference just you know doesn't affect anything but we don't come up with lists of mutations that cause no effect right that wouldn't make any sense the medical literature is replete with examples of <clears throat> of mutations that cause harm, well-known ones, but nobody makes lists of mutations that have no effect. Right? They're not favorite. Yeah, it's sele selection bias. Yeah, it's a selection yeah. bias. Yeah. The, the, the only, the only and of, of the mostly most of the ones to be noticed are the ones that have a, have a very negative effect too. Like even that, uh, I think there was actually a study that uh, sequenced uh, like uh, a whole bunch of uh, people's genomes. Okay. What they found was like what they found was sort of very interesting. Is was like many of them, or not not many, but a few of these uh, uh, participants have mutations that would have been otherwise very damaging but they are not they are normal for some reason mm. and, and we can go and we can't go back to them to to recheck because they were anonymous participants they were they're like it's it's hmm. uh, <laughs> okay interesting too yeah it's uh that is interesting yeah <clears throat> i'm sorry they just don't even try it's like they put in no effort and that's also why I that's also why I do this show. Right? If they're not going to put in effort in their claims, why should I have to put in effort to debunk them? They're just idiots. They just have no idea what they're talking about and that's it. That's the whole thing. Okay. Anyway. Continue. Right, moving on. As a whole, yep, and are not fatal. Somebody explain that one to me briefly. Uh, who wants to, you start and Stephen will. If, um, I'm, if, uh, if I want to direct the assembly of an animal, that I've got to get in there early before they've finished putting them together, putting all the, you know, the hoofs on and getting the wool on. I've, if he's a sheep, I like sheep. I have to say, you know, I have to get in there early before they start building them. So they don't accidentally build a mouse or a, or a leopard or a, or a zebra. I have. Who on earth is building what animals? What the frick is he talking? That where, where's this factory? Right? Can, can I is, can I come visit? I want to see. What, who what is build. he talking about? What's Joe doing? What Joe, Joe's building a sheep. Talking about Joe's building a sheep. Can I buy? Can I can borrow some hooves from your cow to put on my sheep. 
Peter, you know, it's a it's a famous problem in biology that sometimes like species just give birth to the wrong species. Mm -hmm. Right. Like an elephant will just accidentally give birth to like a starfish or something. Common problem, you know, happens yes. all the time. Yes. Just... Uh, I, f I found this, the study. It's it involves a comprehensive screen of uh, 874 genes in over a half a million genomes. Mm -hmm. And they identified 13 adults harboring mutations for eight severe Mendelian conditions. But they have no reported medical manifestations of these diseases, which is pretty interesting. Like it's that is interesting. Yeah. So it, it may like maybe for some reason that this disease got not, got not expressed in spite of this mutation that is normally associated with the genetic disease. That's really cool. Huh? Yeah. Although of, uh, one important thing is like we cannot go back and recheck. That's one thing. Like we cannot, we cannot. It's difficult to find out what the reason was that made them uh, immune to this uh, mm. genetic defect. Right. Also, Dalton makes a good point. Isn't that the plot of Stuart Little? Correct. Actually, Hugh Laurie gave birth to Stuart Little. That's how that happened. <laughs> yeah. A little high, little ho. <laughs> I love I love House. I, I like that. Yeah, we, we, all, we also see some of these American movies. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's actually one of my favorite uh, uh, my favorite childhood movies to watch, and it, oh, okay. it was dubbed. It was dubbed in Dutch for okay. children, of course. But yeah. Mm. Nice. I actually, you know what? I just watched the other day, um, uh, the new All Quiet on the Western Front. The movie it's in mm. German because the you know the soldiers are German, uh, but it's dubbed in English. But I thought it was like an American movie. I thought it was made in. So I wonder. I, I could be wrong. Maybe someone can fact check me on that. But I thought it was an American made movie. Which I was like, was it American made? But all the actors were German. And so they had to dub it into mm. English? I was like, that's very strange. I don't know. I could be wrong, but I think that's what happened. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, well, we're pretty close to the two-hour mark, so... You're, you're so different. Um, oh, you're so different from me. I I don't watch movies. I recently found out that um, the, uh, the team that found the Titanic has published all of the footage for the first time uh, since, what was it, 1985, 1984, when they, when they found it? That's a, 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 a 90 minute, 80 or 90 minute video. So that that's on my watch list instead of a movie. Okay. But uh, yeah, so you wanna you wanna All end right. it here, Jackson? Yeah, we'll we'll call it for for today, um, and then we'll pick it up next week. I, I just intelligent design. Uh, to to like paraphrase RJ because I don't remember what the exact quote was was like it's it's all the dogma of young earth creationism but with even fewer fact claims <laughs> right mm -hmm. they they they're like oh yeah we know we're right we know evolution's wrong but they argue even less stuff they just don't even try they do not even try what do you guys have going on this week I have a I have a, a, uh... a project running at the moment and i'm i'm trying i i already asked you jackson you you didn't find anything uh so uh, if there are people watching i'm looking for a book it is written by a guy called al yahiz and um he is what they say the father of the theory of evolution uh he wrote a book translated into english uh, it was it was Kitab al Hayawan, which translates to the Book of Animals, and he wrote that book a thousand years before Darwin. Mm -hmm. And so I mentioned that to Arn Ra, and Arn would really like to do a show on uh, on this particular guy. Um, closest I have found is that uh, there's a woman called Jeannie Miller from the University of Toronto who did a. Uh, kind of a study on uh, on this guy and on on the book but i'm looking for the english translation so if there's anyone out there 
uh, I found uh, there's a French translation that you can buy from Amazon, but I haven't been able to find an English translation. If there are people who can help me with that, that would be greatly appreciated. Oh, Peter, tu parles français? Uh, je ne parle fr pas français. Uh, just un petit peu. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, well. Papa fume une pipe. Daddy smokes a pipe. <laughs> yeah. my, I have to say, I'm a I'm a big nerd. One of my favorite memes is the Ceci n'est pas une pipe. Um, and all the things that people have done with it. With that one meme, like someone did um uh like Crocodile Dundee, and he's like uh you know, he says uh Ceci n'est pas une pipe, Ceci une pipe, and he's like holding like a a big pipe. <laughs> I thought it was or um someone did one with tucker carlson where he shows the picture on his screen he says sorry liberals that's a pipe <laughs> 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 like that one a lot mm -hmm. that one was pretty funny um omelette du fromage yeah exactly smitty yeah. <laughs> omelette du fromage <laughs> i had a friend who was a quebecois uh at um or when i was at lsu baton rouge he was only there for like a semester doing a, a foreign program. Uh, it, but it, it is pronounced him. Baton Rouge. Baton Rouge. Baton, yeah, Baton, Baton Rouge. With, uh, yeah, I would talk with him in French. That was fun. Um, mm -hmm. He was a cool guy. Do you, do you guys uh, learn French in school in America? I, I did. I, I was can? unfortunately... I, I had a... I, my French teacher was... Uh, I think every boy's dream, blonde, uh, voluptuous, and always wore a white shirt and a short black skirt. So I didn't learn a thing. I was otherwise <laughs> occupied during those lessons. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I was I, I was an adolescent, an adolescent uh, boy discovering. But there were other things than toys. So I I learned French from um seventh grade through senior year, so twelfth grade. Uh or no I didn't, sorry, uh eleventh grade. Um yes, most places in America offer Spanish in the early years, uh, but uh yeah, where Dalton and I live, they offer French. Um yeah, a lot of schools, like a lot of elementary schools in Louisiana, offer French, but not very much. Um, I I took French uh, from middle through high school. Um, I, I mean, I don't really use it. Uh, I've started doing Duolingo Spanish. Um, I'm not very, I'm not confident with it yet. So, <clears throat> at any rate, well, 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 the I'm not. I'm, I wasn't very interesting in language guy, but I'm very interested in the in the evolution of language. Mm -hmm. Like, how, how, now, very interesting about how how words change, now the meanings of words change. Yeah, like I, one, one of the interesting things that I found out recently is, uh, like, uh, you know, you know the uh, the ancestral language of uh, of most languages in the world, the Indo-European, uh, mm. a Proto-Indo-European language. It like it turns out that they have. They often have two words that refer to the same thing, but they are of different genders, uh, animate and inanimate. And from the animate, we got uh, feminine, uh, feminine and masculine, and from the inanimate, we got neuter. neuter. It's a very... Uh, and, you can, and you can also see how many different languages got different genders, like a Dutch, Dutch got also different genders in the language, and uh, of course French too. But uh, English, you dropped, you dropped the, 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 the genders in your vocabulary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very interesting yeah. how, how, that, how that happens. Very true. Although yeah. I think uh, Peter's got a, a rambunctious dog who's ready to roll. So uh, we'll, we'll... For some, the, for we'll some reason, show. he always knows when it's the end of the show. And then he comes up and he needs, he needs a cuddle. <laughs> See? It's, well, it's, it's uh, Pav Pavlov. Yeah, he learn. He learns uh, when uh, when he gets attention. Well, he's yeah. he's picking up bad right, habits well. from uh, Arn's dog because he he has been known to completely interfere with with live shows, barking, attacking <laughs> me for no reason whatsoever. 
uh, Arn, Arn is has having the same problem with Valcor, so I'm I'm going to blame Arn for this. Just Fair because. <laughs> Alrighty, well, uh, we are going to sign off for tonight because uh, we're a little bit past the two-hour mark. So thank you guys, everybody uh, in the live chat for watching. Really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Nestle, for coming and being part of the show. And thank you, Peter, for hosting the show, as always. Yes, yes. how difficult it might be at times. Um, one, one, one last shameless plug. Uh, oh, he ripped out my my headphones. Hold on. Oh, oh. So we're going to probably have. Oh, I'm going to hear myself from your yeah, end. Yeah, yeah. Now, now the echo should be gone. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> That's enough. That's enough. That's right. enough. Well, so one one last shameless plug off, so. on on Sunday, oh, okay. uh, I'll be doing a show where people can convince us that a god exists. That is uh, live streamed on Randolph Richardson's channel, and on Tuesday uh, we'll have another show on my channel with the young earth, earth creationists uh, that I'm looking forward to. So if people want to okay. stop by and watch. Oh, that's where you can find us. My my hand is oh, now oh, being Jackson, chewed did, on. Did by, uh, <laughs> did by any chance the uh, like the, l last week we had a someone in the live chat? Uh, did, did, did did they uh, replied in any way after that? Or um, I didn't check, um, but I doubt it. Mm, all right, Maybe just, just curious. This week. If, like you, like you asked him uh, last week uh, whether they want to come on or sometimes. But I don't maybe, yeah. believe. So. I mean, I can check maybe it right now, I guess. Mm -hmm. I can check right meow. Um, oh, what, what's, what, what was his name again? The, uh, the one in the chat. Nope, no comment from him. All right. Oh, God. Never mind. Oh, Never mind. oh no. <laughs> Oh, what? I wish I hadn't read the comments. Oh, there was a creationist who commented something. Actually, the very thing we discussed today. So, mm. but it's a, it's a different different guy than the one last week in the live chat. Yeah, I don't remember, right. but he was also the dude who commented was also like a the January six was like a, a FBI psyop or whatever. So, <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. So anyway, alrighty. Well, thank you everybody for coming. We're gonna sign off. So have a good All night. Right. Catch you guys next week.